Popular music's opiate of choice has been, since the 1920s, heroin. Needless to say, this has been a very poor choice. Several great musicians have had their musical legacy intertwined with the false romance of their drug habits and it becomes blurred as to where they end as musicians and the drugs begin. Here are 12 tales from the dark end of the street, where some went to dance with the dragon and lived, some perished and some hung in a terrible limbo. When one thinks of the drug-ravaged, depraved, vespertine world of the Rolling Stones, one thinks of the shambling, monstrous drug vampire that was Keith Richard, or the more delicate and discreet Mick Taylor, but no one dwells on the third junk fiend in the band, urbane, professional, dapper Charlie Watts. But Watts spent the years between 1983 and 1986 in his own heroinic haze, the result of what he describes as a midlife crisis where he simply became another person. Two incidents pulled him out of it. The first was a stern lecture from Richards after Watts had nodded off in the studio, which embarrassed Watts as a lapse of his professional standards. And the second was more grievous. He stumbled and fell outside Ronnie Scott's club and broke his ankle. And as he recovered from his injury, he jettisoned his vices. The smack, the speed, the booze. He returned to family and hearth and never relapsed to the evil of heroin. They say Bill Evans's life was the longest suicide in history. He was first exposed in 1958 while he was playing with Miles Davis. Philly Joe Jones hooked him up and that was the beginning of a 20 years journey through various levels of hell. Always an overly sensitive chap, the deaths of Sonny Clark from himself an overdose and Scott LaFaro pushed him into a near catatonic state of grief that lasted most of the 1960s. Kicking finally with the aid of methadone, he beat one addiction only to pick up an equally destructive cocaine habit. The suicide of his beloved brother Harry brought on one final relapse and the fatal damage was done. Pursuing a hectic touring schedule to maintain his habit and keep his band together, he caught a cross-country red-eye on 14th of September 1980 and suffered a ruptured ulcer in the back of a New York City cab, dying in the emergency ward of Mount Sinai Hospital the next morning. The mid-60s folk boom brought with it a herd of professional pontificators, mediocre mopers and hopeless no-hopers. But the odd star did rise and Tim Buckley was, when he focused on his strengths, one of the brightest. His output was generally spotty, highlighted by the excellent Hello and Goodbye and the Astral Weeks echoing Star Sailor. But none of his dying albums, even the ones of such quality, ever sold worth a damn. By the time Star Sailor was released in 1970, Buckley had slid into a routine of heroin use and heavy drinking. By the end of a tour, September 75, Buckley celebrated closing on a rare sold out house by spending the weekend partying at various clubs. At some point, the party moved to the house of his good friend, Richard Keeling, who produced a bag of heroin. With friends like that, who needs enemies? An extremely drunk Buckley then snorted a quality and passed out on the living room floor, the party going on around him. After some time, Buckley's friends noticed his state and took him home to his wife, Judy, who put him to bed. Checking in on him a few hours later, she found him non-responsive and having turned blue. The coroner called the time of death at 9.42 on 26th of June 1975, caused by acute heroin and alcohol intoxication. There are few more harrowing stories of downfall and of what rock bottom looks like than the story of Topper Heaton, one time drummer for The Clash. By 1982, Heaton was a wreck. Initially, he satisfied his habit by snorting or freebasing heroin, but as The Clash started to pressure him over his unreliability and arrange fitful spells in rehab, it all became too much. Joe Strummer sacked Topper, despite him having written their soon to be huge hit single, Rock the Casbah. With his money ebbing away, he bought a crummy broken down car and set up as a minicab driver. Until inevitably the car wouldn't go anymore. So Topper was reduced to busking on a pair of bongos for coins in the underground where junkies are not known for their ability to formulate good life choices and Topper was no exception. In his words, I started sticking needles in my arm, which I'd never done before. Only a junkie can think, I'll show you, I'll fuck myself up even more. <laughs> 
While ironically the Clash were touring the US playing stadiums, Topper was squatting in a windowless flat in Fulham. In 1983, Topper received a substantial royalty check from CBS, author's royalties for Rock the Casbah. Topper ran through the money in under 18 months and ended up doing 15 months in jail for dealing. After release, Topper found himself living in a hostel off Carlsberg Special Brew and cold tin soup. His liver started to pack in. He needed a miracle. And behold, on his 13th trip to rehab, by some miracle, it stuck. Nowadays, he works to fund a narcotic anonymous group in Dover, the town where he hit rock bottom, and is good mates with the surviving members of The Clash. The self-proclaimed Jezebel of Jazz and one of its supreme vocal talents, Anita O'Day, lived such a life of adventure and misadventure, it's amazing she lived long enough to die in her sleep at the age of 87. Starting out in Gene Krupa's band in the early 1940s, she had first endured a seemingly ceaseless string of marijuana busts across the decade before graduating to heroin on the logic that it was preferable to alcohol. She took a first pinch for heroin in 1953 and did six months inside. So profound a blurred in heroin render over her senses across the 50s that when she appeared in the 1958 Newport Jazz Festival, she had no memory of her performance, even though it was included in a film called Jazz on the Summer's Day, which made her a superstar. Despite mounting fame, she mired herself deeper and deeper in addiction and came close to death from overdose in 1967, 68 and 70. After the third OD, she went through a brutal cold turkey withdrawal and made her triumphant return at the Berlin Jazz Festival. Heroin took her to the door of death three times where she kicked its pale ass and the horse it rode in on, enjoying a long post-heroin career as a singer, author and actress until almost the very end. Ray Charles says that for every hour he spent as an entertainer, he spent 10 as a businessman. And to him, for most of those 19 years as a stone junkie, maintaining his habit ranked alongside maintaining his bank balance and his overweening ego as part of the daily order of business. Ray had been a hardcore junkie since 1946, after his mother Aretha's death and his move to Jacksonville, utterly alone in the world to work as a musician in the Dukes and late night clubs. Perhaps he had a pain he felt he couldn't numb, perhaps he felt a need to feel in with the hip crowd, and perhaps he just liked, but Ray took his junk very seriously and always had a member of his entourage on hand to score for him and help him fix up. Ray was busted twice for possession in 1955 in Philadelphia and again in New York in 1958, before the effects of long-term use finally caused him to get sloppy and he was nailed in a calamitous bust in Indianapolis in 1961. Made to endure an early version of the perp walk, the sound of the cameras firing constantly reduced him to tears. The judge, however, threw the case out for the lack of a warrant and entrapment. Ray's road to Damascus moment came on Halloween 1964 at Boston's Logan Airport. Forced to admit to a court that he'd been an addict for 15 years, Ray checked himself into rehab and beat the dope in four days. Impressed, the judge gave him a five-year suspended sentence. Many years later, long after his outlaw years were behind him and Ray was treated as the national treasure he deserved, he made the off-the-cuff comment, If I'd known I'd lived so long, I would have taken better care of myself. Heroin had the last laugh, however, for having ravaged Ray's liver in his younger days, it was that poor liver that finally gave in and did for possibly the greatest American post-war popular musician. Trumpeter Freddie Webster was probably the least well-known of the architects of bebop in the early to mid-1940s, but equally one of the most influential. His fat, warm tone and an alarming inversion of cliched phrases mesmerized both Dizzy Gillespie and Miles Davis, who has nothing but praise for him in his autobiography. Webster was, like Parker, Davis, Roach, et al., deeply mired in heroin, and died gruesomely when he took some dope offered to him by Sonny Stitt, the famed saxophonist. Stitt was a brutal junkie who took to beating up people in order to get money for dope. On April 1st, 1947, Stitt passed a bag of heroin onto Webster, of which Webster heartily partook in his room in the Strode Hotel in Chicago. 
Unfortunately, this dose had been laced with battery acid intended for stit, and Webster died in a prolonged convulsive agony. Out of deference to the owners of the hotel, the attending physician gave the cause of death as heart attack. Sonny Rollins, another monster junkie of the 50s and 60s, wrote a song on his amazing saxophone Colossus album called Strode Road in memory of Webster. If Ray Charles was the model of a functional junkie, never missed a gig or a session due to his habit, who carried a retinue about to maintain his drug schedule, and Topper Hidden, the non-functional dope fiend, then Dr. John, over the course of his 34-year addiction, knew both sides of the line. Starting in New Orleans, scuffling for fixes here and there, working unsuccessfully as a pimp and doing two years in prison, fame which came in 1968 simply funded higher risk behavior and the career slump after the mid-1970s saw him living in desperate and depraved circumstances on the lower west side of New York City. The good doctor's life turned around when he met B.B.'s son Roman, another expatriate yat with whom he shared a taxi after a gig. Saint Roman became his personal assistant, his manager and agent. Saint Roman began to reorganize his bookings and began to ensure that the doc had the dope he needed when and where he would need it. Dr. John survived basically because this woman took to micromanaging his habit. In December 1989, after his 19-year-old daughter Tara had seen various goings-on in Paris and said she would never speak to him again until he went to rehab, did the doc find the will to quit. He became a fanatical devotee of 12-step meetings. He stayed clean and working for the next all but 30 years until a heart attack at daybreak on June 6, 2019 took him across the river along with Buddy Bolden, King Oliver, Louis Armstrong and Fats Domino, to name but a few of his predeceased peers. There are few more pathetic tales than that of Lee Morgan. Few sadder takes of promise squandered to heroin and of life's cruel vicissitude for its survivors. A teenage prodigy who'd played as a featured soloist in Dizzy Gillespie's band before he'd graduated high school, Morgan made his debut on Blue Note in 1956, and his big breakthrough came the next year on John Coltrane's Blue Train album, leaving the ensemble with authority and blowing a mind-bendingly good solo on Locomotion. He joined up with Art Blakey's group, which was a disastrous choice because Blakey was a proselytizing junkie who liked to get his new players hooked, so he could control them. He told Morgan he could turn him on in two weeks. Morgan was the epitome of the non-functional user, his habit ever growing and consuming him until after one near fatal overdose, he simply lost all interest or all capacity to make music, hocked his horn and gave himself up to the drug. And he learned strategy to better manage his addiction. Almost immediately, he was back in the studio. During a break in one such session, Morgan retreated to a bathroom where he, as well as probably fixing up, wrote on sheets of lavatory paper his biggest hit, The Irrepressible, The Sidewinder, a jazz standard which went to make number 35 on the pop charts. But Morgan was unable to hold out. By 1967, he was on skid row, sleeping shoeless on the pavement outside Birdland or on pool tables in Bowery clubs, wearing a filthy suit over ragged pajamas and stealing TVs from hotel lobbies to feed the addiction. It was sometime in late 1967, his horn long again hocked and his only warm coat gone too, that he stumbled into Helen Moore's halfway house in Hell's Kitchen. Morgan became Moore's personal project and she nursed him, got his horn out of hock, got him into rehab and started booking him gigs, such that by 1969 Morgan was clean and focused enough to start taking on large-scale tours and TV appearances. But of course, it couldn't last. Morgan began seeing another woman and when he turned up with her for a gig at Slug's Saloon in the East Village, Moore snapped and shot him stone dead. He died on the sawdust-covered floor of the saloon. Little Richard, the ever flamboyant architect of rock and roll, Little Richard had gone from hit singles in Hollywood to heroin hell, 
over a 10-year period in the mid-1960s to late 1970s, as he struggled with his wild, sensual nature and his seeming need to redeem himself through spiritual pursuits. After the failure of his ministry and a lukewarm comeback, Richard started to dabble in marijuana and alcohol, and by 1967, cocaine and heroin. Like most users, his good life choices were not typified by over-numerousness, and the worst one was to hire his protege from Specialty Records, Larry Williams, as his producer and musical director. And as it turned out, his drug connection. Williams was more the upside of the head type drug dealer, and he spent 10 years beating the living daylights out of Richard, until one day in 1977 when Richard failed to pay for his package, Williams went on a rampage and hunted Richard down, pulling a gun on him and aiming and cocking it right in his face. Richard then had a timely recollection of where the money was and paid Williams off. The incident served to scare Richard back to the ministry and eventually sobriety, but for Williams it was business as usual. Until the day in January 1980 when he was found dead at home with a large hole in his head. What a delightful chap. Charlie Parker. Parker died in 1955 at the age of 34, a hardcore youngster since 16 who would quaff gallon jugs of rotgut red wine and gorge himself on junk food, seven Mexican dinners or 20 hamburgers on a couple of notable occasions. From 1941 on, he built a cult around some astonishing performances and recordings. Great musicians gravitated to him, but his behavior was infantile, devoid of any notion of consequence or guilt. His drummer Stan Levy called him a sociopath. He broke up his hot band by selling his return ticket from California to New York for dope money. The fall came in August 1946 when he was arrested and charged with indecent exposure, resisting arrest and the suspected arson of a hotel room. He was confined to the Camarillo State Hospital for six months. After release, he seemed to have it together a little better, especially with the dope. But the booze took over and despite making some wonderful music and rebuilding a lot of bridges, his behavior deteriorated beyond his control. He started collapsing on the streets, getting into brawls and even got himself banned from Birdland, the club named in his honor, for nodding off on stage. He tried to kill himself twice. He had two spells in Bellevue and one in prison for not paying child support. He was persona non grata in New York and he started to lose it in his playing. The death of his daughter Pri seemed to finally numb and close off his soul and his playing just became an exhibition of manic velocity. He died choking to death while laughing at some jugglers on TV. Did heroin kill him? Probably not. It was more like the bleeding from burst booze ulcers. But until old Kurt Cobain came along, Parker was probably the most famous junkie ever. But Kurt Cobain wasn't no Charlie Parker, was he? Grant McLennan was one of the voices of the go-betweens, one of the finest songwriters Australia has ever known, and briefly, my neighbor. Not my next door neighbor, but the other side of the street neighbor. Grant's heroin use dating back to the early 80s was never talked about, apparently because Grant was, in the words of his bandmate Robert Forster, a gentleman and needed to be protected. Kind, witty, urbane, and bookish, he didn't so much make friends easily as he did make admirers easily. There was always an element of the four-year-old who suddenly had to deal with the loss of his father and the 11-year-old sent off to boarding school, lonely and terrified, that hung over him. A delicateness, vulnerability, a haunted sense about him, hidden beneath his intelligence and grace. In May 2006, after setting up in the morning for a party in the honor of his fiancee, he felt ill. So he went upstairs for a nap before the party that evening, and there, the preferred story has it that he died of a heart attack. The cause of death is officially undetermined. But rumor and dark aspersions follow the death, chiefly that Grant had relapsed and overdosed. The truth will never be known. For a musician who was only minutely famous, McLennan left an enormous legacy of records about places I knew intimately with a band that so many of my and my peers' bands aspired to sound like, the yellow light, orange light sound. No one knows what that sounds like until you hear it, and then it becomes the music you could all but see in the streets and the front rooms, 
of late summer days in certain places and certain times. I could spend an hour trying to explain, maybe one day I will. Or simple memories of chatting with Grant about the film The 400 Blows of all things at the side of the stage after a gig in 1985. I was quite drunk at the time. Heroin or long-term damage by heroin, it makes no difference. Grant McLennan's death is one of the most profoundly shocking and upsetting events that has ever occurred to me as a music fan.